no joke, seashells can actually help you make better spirits. And if you don't have seashells, well, you can use other things like eggs as well. Let's get stuck in. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is Stillet. And shells and eggs are mostly calcium carbonate. And it turns out that calcium carbonate can be very, very helpful for those of us that are interested in chasing the craft of home distillation. We're gonna get stuck into all of the how in just a little bit, but first, first, just a little bit of why. Why is pH really important for home distillers? I'm guessing that most people watching this video already know what pH is, but just in case, it's a scale from zero to 14 that measures how basic or acidic a solution is, where seven is neutral, zero is strongly acidic, and 14 is strongly basic. The yeast we use to ferment sugar and create alcohol has a range, a pH range that it's most happy in. Generally speaking, and I say generally because different yeasts have different tolerances or preference ranges, but generally a starting pH of somewhere between 4.6 and 6 is going to give you a pretty good fermentation. But as fermentation kicks off, the pH is going to drop. Our fermentation is going to get more acidic. And once again, different yeasts have different tolerances, uh, but generally if that pH stays above about 3.5, we know it's gonna be safe and pH probably isn't going to impact fermentation. If, however, the acidity drops much below about 3.5, things can start to go wrong. The fermentation can slow right down or depending on the yeast, once again, it could stall right out and fermentation could just straight up stop. Right at the beginning here, I just wanna point out that this whole pH thing, I, I don't want it to be taken as a scaremongering topic. At the end of the day, most fermentations are just gonna work if you leave them alone and don't stress about pH. All grain recipes and molasses-based recipes especially tend to just look after themselves. What I'm trying to say here, guys, is if you're fermenting stuff already and it's working for you and it's fermenting out properly, you, you probably don't need to mess with this stuff at all. There are some niche sort of situations where it is more likely to be a problem and it's a really good knowledge to have in terms of problem solving a fermentation if it does get stuck. I just don't want people assuming that they have to do this. If they're not adjusting pH or they're not adding something to buffer pH, they're doing it wrong. Cool? Don't stress. Getting back to these things, shells. They're mostly made up of cal calcium <laughs> carbonate. I'm no chemist, so I am not going to be getting into the weeds on this. And those of you that are chemists, Please guys, help us out in the comment section down below. But a general overview of this for those of you that are catching up on the whole shells thing. The calcium carbonate in these shells is going to try and buffer a solution to around about 7 or 7.5, which is uh, significantly higher than we actually want it. But the thing is, it's going to take quite a long time to do it. And the yeast, remember, is actively trying to push the pH of the solution down lower. Well, not actively, it doesn't the yeast is making it more acidic. <laughs> During active fermentation, because the yeast is making things more acidic, it's very unlikely that we are going to end up with a pH that rises using calcium carbonate or shells, as long as, long as we're using a reasonable amount of the stuff. More on that later on. But if you have shells that haven't been totally used up or other sources of calcium carbonate in the wash, after fermentation finishes, there's a really good chance that the pH is going to continue to creep up if you leave it. Uh, and for that reason, it's not a horrible idea to get the stuff out or use just enough. So if you don't want to distill your product as soon as fermentation's finished, you're not going to end up with a pH that keeps on creeping. You know what else is a good idea? Continuing your personal or professional development with today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses made by teachers who are actually practicing what they teach. Once signed up, you can even experience one of Skillshare's live classes where you get to connect with the teacher directly and learn along with all the other members. I've been watching Marquez Brownlee's course called YouTube Success, and I know, I mentioned this about four months ago to you guys, I'm watching it again because I think it legitimately helped me in the past and I think I can learn more from it. But what do you guys reckon? Has the, uh, has the production value or the general quality of the videos gone up around here over the last six months or something? 
So check the link in the description down below. The first 1,000 still at subscribers that click that link will get a free month trial for Skillshare. You can get a lot of learning done in the month, guys. So we've briefly mentioned a few different sources of calcium carbonate that we can use, but you can also buy the stuff literally just as a powder. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with using that, really. But to be honest, a lot of distillers do seem to steer away from using the powder just because it's, it's a little bit more of a sledgehammer and less of a scalpel. Uh, it tends to work a whole lot quicker and react a whole lot quicker, probably because of the insanely huge surface area to volume ratio compared to something like shells. But luckily for us, shells are very abundant in our world and uh, cheap, or to be honest, free. And it's pretty obvious that they've got a much, much smaller surface area, which is gonna make them react a whole lot slower. So I've got a couple of prop shells for this video, but uh, I need some more. Thankfully, I live really, really close to the coast. Uh, and even more thankfully, I have kids. Guys. I need shells for my work. Where can we find shells? Beach. You want to go to the beach? from the beach with our spoils and uh, here's the thing guys for the most part I'm gonna stop playing with these because they're really noisy but for the most part shells is shells is shells uh, white ones probably best uh, but here's the thing guys if you don't live near the beach and you can't just go and pick these things up for free or you know get your kids to do it <laughs> there are other ways in this world to get shells if you want to specifically use shells you can get the stuff from the pet store uh, crushed and, and rinsed oyster shells for example you can go to the supermarket and buy whatever shellfish they have, cook it up, eat it, and use the shells afterwards. Or, or, use eggshells. That'll work too. I honestly hadn't even thought of that <laughs> until I saw a post on uh, the New Zealand Home Distiller Group not long ago. Anyway, moving on. They don't take a whole lot of preparation, guys, but uh, I would suggest obviously giving them a really thorough rinsing uh, and probably giving them a solid boil for 10 minutes as well just to break down any other crap that's gone onto them and uh, get that off there. But do you really need them? Like I said at the beginning of the video, guys, uh, an all grain wash or a wash with a whole lot of molasses in it, for example, has the ability to buffer itself pretty well already. You probably don't need to use anything like this in it. It's up to you. Personally, for those sort of things, I tend to, to err on the side of just leave it alone if it's probably gonna be okay. And then if it's not, you can adjust it later on. And you can use shells to adjust as well, that's fine. I'm just saying, you don't need to rush out there and be throwing shells in everything you ferment. On the other hand, sugar washes and generational recipes. These are the two things that tend to go really sour really quick. Sugar washes can go sour quickly because they've got honestly sweet F all in them to help buffer the solution. So that effect of the yeast making things more acidic is gonna be much, much, much more pronounced. Uh, the generational recipes, things like uh, UJSSM or anything where you're taking stillage or dunnage or backset or whatever you wanna call it out of the still and putting it back into recipes. I mean, that stuff can get really acidic really quick, especially after a few, few generations and it can make a really big impact on the fermentation itself. So these are the two situations, sugar washes uh, and generational recipes where I might tend to add something in in terms of a preventative rather than a cure. And I'll be honest guys, I've never done that before. I've never felt I needed to, but in the past I've always been working with uh, slaked lime, which is a freaking sledgehammer compared to shells. So now that I have shells on hand, I might do it preventatively a little bit more often. Before we move on guys, just remember that a acidic fermentation is actually a good thing. The lower acidity helps to stave off a whole host of other stuff that might want to grow in our lovely sugary water. Yeast can tolerate that acidity. It may not be entirely happy, but the good thing is, is if the yeast is just a little bit unhappy, then all the other stuff that would be growing in there otherwise is just, it, it can't, it can't compete with the yeast at that pH. So just another reminder guys that an acidic wash is not necessarily a bad thing. Dosage and method, how much do we use and how do we use it? If you look around the internet, there is a bunch of different people suggesting actually quite a large range in terms of how much you should use. And you 
probably should take note at this point in time that there are actually more than a couple of different answers to this, simply because your specific situation is likely to be very different to someone else's. And the biggest difference you're gonna have is your water. The water chemistry of your specific water that you're using to brew with is gonna affect this drastically. So a little bit of experimentation is uh, probably in order. In saying that, I think it's safe to recommend about a small handful of shells for a 50 liter fermentation. That's, Americans, this much. <laughs> now, of course, you can just Throw those things straight on into the fermenter. That's fine, but there is a couple of potential downsides to this. One, you now have shells stuck in the tube in the bottom of your fermenter, depending on how you deal with your tube, how you dispose of it, uh, how big your shells are, so on and so forth. That actually may present a small problem for you. Number two, it is going to be much, much harder for you to get any idea uh, whether or not those shells are actually being completely used up or whether they're just sitting there, you're not really gonna be able to tell if you just chuck them in the bottom of your fermenter until I guess at the end if you wanna go hunting through the tube. And number three, you can't just pull them out <laughs> if you decide you need to. If the pH does start creeping up too high and getting too basic, you can't just pop them out. Or if you're not gonna be distilling the wash right after it finishes fermenting and you need to let it sit for three weeks, you can't just pull the rest of the shells out and uh, you know not have that pH creep up. A pretty logical solution to this conundrum is just to throw those shells into something like a cotton bag or even something like a, uh, a hop spider if you've, you've got brewing equipment around. Hang them over the edge of the fermenter, suspend them halfway up, uh, and then you can pull them up whenever you want. The downside to this is obviously that is going to make things a whole lot harder to have a completely sealed fermentation under an airlock. If that's your jam, then cool, I get it, I understand, you might want to work something out. But honestly guys, a lot of distillers just don't bother with the airlock. I need to say a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much, Patreons. Uh, you are the people that let me do this week in, week out. So thank you guys, I, I mean, what do I say? <laughs> Thanks. So to wrap this up, guys, uh, pH is not the boogeyman. Don't go looking for it where you don't need to. If you're already fermenting stuff and it's already fermenting well, don't stress about it. But if you do have a little bit of an issue with stored fermentations, a pH meter might be a really good buy. Uh, I'll link a couple in the description down below. Some of these things are getting cheap now. They're not overly accurate, but they'll give you a great idea at a cheap price. Uh, anyway, if you are getting stored fermentations and it is because of pH, then this is an easy fix with something like calcium carbonate from, <coughs> from shells. <laughs> eggs or whatever other source you want to use. So I hope this helped you out guys. Uh, if you are a regular user of shells, please guys let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, if you think I've missed something, if you think I've misrepresented some of these ideas, feel free to have a discussion in the comment section as well. Uh, just be civil human beings. And, and I'll catch you next time guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.